is, is to get distributors on side with this and show them the benefits of licensing their work for, for reuse. Um, because it's going to make, it, it'll make them money, which is, I know we're coming on to the money shortly. Um, the other part, the other issue we have outside of soundtracking is with um, copyrighted characters. Uh, you saw in there, for, in the video we showed, you saw Frozen Sing Along and you saw Harry Potter. Frozen Sing Along, Disney filed an injunction in the UK that no one is allowed to say that they are Elsa anymore. You can be a snow princess. You cannot be Elsa. Um, Harry Potter, the experience that we did in 900 year old monastery with sneaky experience. We had to say every character was based on JK Rowling's original book characters rather than the film. That is how you get around it and the distributor were fine with that. And we didn't say it's a Harry Potter weekend, we said it is a wizarding experience. So with when you there is there is loopholes and they're varied and we are only just learning about this. And I'm trying to advise anyone that's interested in creating new work the best route to go down to, to get new work made. And that's part of the research you've been doing anyway, yeah. is looking into that anyway. Yeah. And every exhibitor and every artist we have spoken to has said licensing is the number one barrier. The director piece is good too, because when you go to the distributor, the the main reason that they, they want to do it also, for the most part, and the, the thing that is complicated is their own licensing piece, and then they can't do anything that's going to piss off the director. So it always goes like kind of the distributor. I've gone through distributor to ask director to get stuff. Uh, but yeah. yeah. Just try all the routes, all of them. Okay, so uh, to record or not to record, uh, or live streaming. So uh, for me, this is um, the reason I've added this question is because it crosses that line between live cinema and uh, event cinema. So it's kind of how do you make sure that you aren't going into somebody else's territory, perhaps? And then also, would you, I mean, Gary, would you, would you record one of your shows? Or? I think for what I do, it doesn't work as well recorded. I mean, first of all, you have got the legal side that you were just touching, and that, that would make that a complete nightmare anyway. But um, from the way I see it, I, when I do my shows, it's much more about the live experience. People are dancing as well. It's not quite the same. You wouldn't want to kind of sit at home and watch a DJ for an hour and a half on your TV. It's, it's not the same as an immersive event where you're actually enjoying it. So for what I do, not to record. Okay. Um, and then what about live streaming? Would you consider that? I also think it takes away from the experience. I think it's about being there and actually, you know, one of these things where you're not looking at a screen on your phone by yourself, you're with a bunch of people and that's the enjoyment of it. What if you live stream out to other cinemas? I think it works for some events. I don't think it works for the DJ thing. I think the same thing, you wouldn't want to go to a club and hear a live streaming DJ from another club. It just takes away from the... I'm going to live stream your highball show tonight <laughs> to another Alamo. We'll see. Yeah, prove me, prove me wrong. <laughs> I think the, the, other, the other angle of this would be to um, make it freely available online at the same time as well. So then it's not necessarily live streaming or recording. It's still a one-time thing, but people have to dip into online. We did a show um, with archive films with new uh, chamber music and existing chamber music with new artists film and we put that online and actually we had you know ten times as many people watch it online as we could fit inside the cinema so in a way you're actually getting increased uh, awareness and reach of your artwork I think it's different for different shows as well because I've seen um, re-soundtracking of movies that would really work to be recorded because you would just want to hear it as an album yeah. or see it as an experience anyway. So it depends on the show. Yeah, yeah, okay, I agree. We're in agreement. Um, so box office fad. Um, so I just wanted to touch on a couple of points with this um, about quantity and quality and quantity versus quality, I suppose. Um, I want to start with you, you Lisa, if you could touch on the like genuine costs involved with producing live cinema. Okay, and this is going to be, I already know this is going to be incredibly different to what it is in the US. But we use dollars. <laughs> Thank you. Well, hey. <laughs> so, in the UK, live cinema would not exist without public subsidy from the Arts Council and the British Film Institute. 
we just it just won't be happening. The only thing that'll be happening is secret cinema because they're they're entirely commercially funded through box office. Um, the main reason for that is if you're doing a, I'll take live soundtracks as an example. Um, if you're show, doing a live soundtrack in a cinema space, you don't have the equipment for the band to come in for, for a start. You need to hire in the additional PA. There's very few spaces that are set up for live soundtrack events, and you need you need a tech team that know how to do the click track and the sync and work with the the artist to make sure it's it's bang on. Um, even before you get to that point, you've got the commissioning of the artist to spend months, sometimes years, working on the composition and trying to get the rights. And do you just want some ballpark figures? <laughs> uh, I just wanted to get a sense, really, of how many times you would have to repeat it to make it to make it viable. <laughs> um, so a lot of co new commissions come from film festivals, especially for live soundtracks. And ballpark figure for a band to do to do the bands at the level to get the enough people in at ten thousand dollars around that upwards depending yeah. on the level of the artist for, for, to get them to do the score you know it, it depends on it's, it's totally depends on schedule but one one major problem is capacity of venues we need to <laughs> Cinema spaces in the UK. What what sort of capacity is it? Show showrooms about two hundred. Uh, biggest one is two eighty. So two eighty. If we were spending ten pounds a ticket, two thousand eight hundred is not going to even pay your band for that night. So this is this is why we need public public subsidy to make this these amazing experiences happen. But it's also the reason box office prices are so high for certain events like secret cinema because. There's a hell of a lot that goes into it. Do you want to come in? I'm, just, I'm fascinated at your questioning about the like quality versus quantity and the idea that like you seem to have that. And we were talking about the other one where you just did it the one time, and you you seem like you really like the idea of it's sorry guys you missed out. Whereas on my side, like the Jaws on the Water event, our budget for that is about three hundred thousand dollars to try to get the whole production put together. So we're doing a bunch of them because <laughs> it's the only way that it's going to work. And if I have a band that I paid ten thousand dollars to rescore a film, I want as many people as possible to be able to experience that. Yeah. And I don't see it as like a hindrance at all or, or ruining the experience for the people that are there for the premiere. I just see it as no, hey, we totally made a cool understand. thing. Let's have that everybody enjoy it. I think it probably depends on the kind of um, different. Um, things in place really so something like Jaws you were obviously having to install and off-site anyway so you could once you've laid out for that you've got to keep it going but if you were doing something in venue you couldn't take out six weeks of, of your biggest screen for it uh, so that's my, my issue is that it always has to be in venue it doesn't always have to be in venue but predominantly it does or I have to spend thousands of pounds on uh, big blow up screens yeah. and then it's not viable so I can't take out the biggest cinema in the you know peak time of the year for a month or something. Also I think there's an element of the uniqueness of a kind of one-off event that really makes it like an incredible thing and I, not, I don't want people to miss out that's absolutely not <laughs> what I want but I really think it's important that you have like a unique thing that you're doing it's not just like oh yeah it's that one where we throw stuff at the screen or you know it's like something really incredible and I think if you put that effort in as artists to create you know incredible new soundtracks or new film and stuff like that it needs to be really special for people it can't be like something that's on for 10 weeks so in one sense like making the maths of it work it's just like promoting any cultural thing it needs to be popular enough and on a scale that's big enough that it works out for everyone yeah and with enough public subsidy and with these things <laughs> uh, yeah i think uh, public subsidy is like it helps loads of the events that i do in the uk but i do think that if the scale is right and that does mean taking it outside of just a regular seated kind of movie theater putting up you can hire a screen in anywhere and as long as there's enough space then it's you know you can make the maths of it work yeah and I think that for me that's the way festivals come in because they've got the collateral of several thousand people in one place usually anyway so you've got that 
yeah, you know, you've got people already bought into the whole idea. Live cinema at festivals is definitely a thing that exists already now in the UK. And it, it, like you say, when you've got thousands of people there already and different setups in different tents, that's yeah. a great way to make it work. And you've got expertise on site as well, so you don't have to kind of ship people in all the time. Um, and the other thing I wanted to talk about is ticket pricing. Um, so, um, as Lisa touched on, we receive public subsidy in the UK for providing um, cultural programming, essentially. Um, and it's really important to me that we maintain accessible programming, um, that we aren't um, excluding people based on their income um, and their age as much as we can, and making sure that um, venues are, uh, you know, disabled friendly. You can get soundtracks um, on headphones, all of these things, that's always what I take into account, but mostly ticket price, because I think um, in the UK, Secret Cinema, what they do is incredible, but it is extortionately expensive, and for normal people, it's just it's too much, it's really too much, and it creates a, like an elite uh, film buff world that's just totally what I fight against day in, day out. Um, so I wondered if Henry could talk about how you make sure that your ticket prices is reasonable for people to come to and do you offer like various levels of pricing? Depending on the event, if we've, if we've taken over a large venue, um, we do events inside at the Long Center and then there's tiered pricing based on where the seat is so that there's an upper balcony. Um, obviously that is a different experience. but. I start each event with, I mean, you get the idea and then you lay out the basic budget for what is it going to take to do this and then what are the available revenue streams since we don't have any subsidy. So there's the, okay, well, what is what is the reasonable ticket price for what I think that this experience is worth? And, and so it's never about gouging everybody, but it's like, let's, you know, it feels like Jaws is a special thing. Yeah, a normal movie ticket is 10 bucks, and you can stay home and just watch it, but it's really expensive for us to put it together, so our ticket price is around 30 bucks to get into that. Would you ever take it from the other angle and start with, I want to produce something for this particular audience, and their price range is X, so I need to work with that as the budget in mind? Kind of flip it on its head? I don't frequently, but I would. I, like, I wouldn't not do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I would just need to figure out. I mean, the other way is you. Well, we also do some free shows, and yeah. then it's the. For us, it's let's get sponsors involved as that other revenue stream, or figure out uh, how we're going to make money off of concessions. Um, but we'll do. We do a big summer series on the lawn of the Long Center that's very similar to what they're doing with the outdoor oh, screenings definitely. right now. Um, and that's that's always free and paid so that's for. That's an, an element of tiering, basically. I think we've done the same with the Huddersfield sci-fi stuff. Yeah, was I was going to say free, that, wasn't it? Yeah, that one we did in Huddersfield, we had how many people there? 8,000 people. 8, people. And that's in a town of 200,000 people, so that's quite a high percentage yeah, of population. Yeah, that was, free, that was government funded. And free yeah, that was subsidised by the local council and British Film Institute. But then well. at the same time, I like, have a show coming up in London, which is sponsored by a drinks company, where they've commissioned me to do a Best of Bill Murray AV show, and that way you've got the sponsor behind it, and it's still free for people, so that's another so way. So you find thing. other ways. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna do shows in the UK though. All this subsidy sounds way too fun. No, no, you can't have it because it's mine. It's, it's <laughs> an interesting. It, it may, because of the public subsidy, it's not like we can go. Oh, let's do Star Wars every week. It, it, it pushes us to do more left field and art house things as well, which, which is really sounds interesting. great. Like we were talking before, it's like I really love Back to the Future, but I'm kind of tired of showing it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the subsidy allows us to create to to make live cinema as art. I think because yeah, the point is the response to the title to be, of this panel. It has to be culturally important. It can't be people getting together to have just a great time with a film that everybody can watch at home anyway. It's got to be miserable there somehow. Needs, <laughs> <laughs> there needs to be a reason for it, and it needs to be a cultural reason. Then that reason could be uh, such and such a portion of the population are totally underserved by our cultural provision. So we're going to play a, a, a mainstream film, but pitch everything towards getting that audience in. Or it could be this is an incredible film that we want people to rediscover. So um, it, it doesn't. It just it can't just be like let's have a great party. Although that would be good sometimes. Um, so there's just a couple more things I wanted to touch on before we open for questions. Um, 
The, firstly, uh, Henry, uh, at what point do you have conversations with distributors about new release events on new films? Uh, recently, we've we've really done a lot more and really started building our relationships with distributors. Really, in the past couple of years, and we go as early as possible. They frequently are not much more than six months out when they're doing like a smaller thing. If you're trying to pitch for large marketing dollars from them, um, then you're more of a year, eighteen months out. We're not. We don't have great relationships with the marketing departments yet, so we're still on the exhibitor relations side of, we want to do, uh, we do a lot of um, promo screenings, word of mouth advance type things with uh, talent, and then we do a live stream of those. Um, yeah. And so we'll pitch and kind of eventize that as much as we can. We haven't been able to get the full event that I want. Like the, my favorite thing, at, if we're doing that, is we're doing an advanced screening. We're doing some crazy stunt. We have talent. We live stream it out to our whole circuit. We've got 23 different locations around the country. Uh, and then it's, to your point, it's definitely better if you're in the room with the live people, but you still get a chance to experience it and see the film from other places. Um, and do you think that pays off in terms of when the film is actually on release? Does it? Does it? Does it help kind of sell, it, sell it tickets on weekend does. release? And uh, we are the 23rd largest chain in the United States. And when we partner with the right titles for our audience with the studios, we've noticed that we like have jumped up to number seven. So it shows that it's certainly driving ticket sales inside Alamo venues. And whether it's continuing to drive sales in other venues also, mm. I would say probably, but also they should just see it at Alamo's. Yeah. <laughs> you don't mind, you don't care either way. Um, okay, so... Um, I'm Could I just, just jump in on the new releases thing? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure, um, yeah, yeah. There's very few live cinema events for new release films in the UK, like... The the Suffragette. Suffragette. We did do... If anyone's seen Suffragette, I think, has it been out here yet? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we did Suffragette. That was the first one I've done. We did um, a Suffragette protest through my hometown. Um, stopping at the points where Emmeline Pankhurst and the suffragettes had done speeches and they we, we created a script based on the original speeches that you can find online. Um, so yeah, we've done, we're starting well, to do it. I would say it. that's the first time that um, Exhibition has actually engaged with a distributor prior to new release. The other one, I, the other one I'd mention is Grand Budapest Hotel that Secret Cinema did do a few years ago, but they've not done another new release since. But that did lead to Grand Budapest Hotel being number one at the box office just from that two week run they did. Yeah. So, I, I really think distributors need, need to get on board with this. Like, I, I do speak to but them. To point out from an artist's perspective, one of the challenges of that is timing. Yeah. If you're trying to put together a show for something yeah, yeah, that's brand you need, new. You need the release yeah. date well in, yeah. enough in advance. Um, the other thing I just wanted to pick up on is that for, for artists, I'd love to, for artists and filmmaker teams to think about creating their event as a live event at the point of production. So how can you make this building into your release strategy? How can I get this soundtrack to be performed live? Because as far as I know, that has not been done yet. Yeah, they um, are, they've done it very recently with The Survivalist, which I'm not sure if that's it's a very small budget British film, but mm. the, the band, they part of their um, funding pitch for production funding was that they the had to go on tour. And it would be live. amazing as an artist to be able to get versions of movies with the soundtrack removed. So that that's the main problem. Yeah, that's my main. Sony yeah. will do that. Really? Sony titles, they're they're super into it. They, uh, it's there was somebody doing something with uh, Punch Drunk Love that's been on tour recently, um, and yeah, they're just they're of all of the distributors. Their repertory team is very open to playing. I'm gonna get onto Sony then. <laughs> Okay, um, so we've got a little bit more time left. If anyone has any questions for anyone on the panel, please um, shout at us. Yeah. Hi, uh, so my name is Lior and I curate a film festival back in Israel and basically I've dabbled with uh, live cinema for the last five years. Uh, so it was very exciting to hear you guys on stage and I wanted to ask you about audience participation, which is always a challenge. And do you have any successful horror stories about what you can or cannot expand, what you can or cannot uh, make people do, expect that people will do in those events? 
horror stories. Um, well, I once tried to do a tweet along where everybody basically didn't use Twitter. So that was, wasn't a complete failure because there was me like desperately tweeting as fast as possible so that something was coming up on the screen. But yeah, that was just like pitched at the wrong audience.